He walked like a man recently returned to the world. Every step was careful, deliberate, every step to be relished. He was tall and clean-shaven, a little thin, perhaps, dressed by Seville Row, a light woolen suit of herringbone weave, the jacket wide on the shoulders and narrow in the waist. His fawn gloves matched his trilby. He looked like an Englishman, secure in his right to be on such a street or on such a pleasant avenue noon in spring. But nothing is what it seems. For every step was a little too careful, too deliberate, as if he were unwilling to take even the ground beneath his feet entirely for granted. As he walked, his clever, quick eyes darted from side to side, as if he were determined to record every teeny detail. Toulouse was considered one of the most beautiful cities in the south of France. Certainly, Freddy admired it. The elegance of its 19th century buildings, the medieval past that slept beneath the pavements and concaves. The bell towers and the cloisters of St. Antine, the bold river were dividing the city in two. The pink brick facades, blushing in the April sunshine, gave Toulouse its affectionate nickname of La Ville Le Rosé. Little had changed since Freddy had last visited at the tail end of the 1920s. He had been another man then, a tattered man, worn threadbare by grief. Things were different now. In his right hand, Freddy carried directions, scribbled on the back of a napkin for Binet, where he'd lunched on filet mignon and a blousy bordeaux. In his left hand breast pocket, he carried a letter patterned with antiquity and dust. It was this and that the fact, at last he had an opportunity to return, that brought him back to Toulouse today. The mountains were where he'd come across the document had some strong significance for him, and though he had never read the letter, it was precious to him. Freddy crossed the Place de, de Capitale, heading toward the Cathedral of St. Sonine. He walked through the network of small streets, obtuse little alleyways filled with jazz bars and poetry cellars and gloomy restaurants. He sidestepped couples on the pavement, lovers and families and friends out enjoying the warm afternoon. He passed through teeny squares and hidden relays and along the Rue du Toir until he reached the street he was looking for. Freddy hesitated a moment at the corner as if having second thoughts. Then he continued on, walking briskly now, dragging his shadow behind him. Halfway along the Rue des Penites Glee was a library and an antiquarian bookseller, his destination. He stopped dead to read the name of the proprietor painted in black lettering above the door. Momentarily, his silhouette was imprinted on the building. Then he shifted position, and the window was once more flooded with gentle yellow sunlight, causing the metal grill to glint. Freddy stared at the display for a moment, at the antique volumes embossed with the gold leaf and the highly polished leather slipcases of black and red, at the ridged spines of works by Montaigne and Antoine France and Maupas, other less familiar names too, and volumes of ghost stories by Blackwood and James and Sheridan Le Fonu. Now or never, he said. The old-fashioned handle was stiff, and the door dug in its heels as Freddy pushed it open. A brass bell rattled somewhere distant at the back of the shop. The coarse rush maddeningly sighed beneath the soles of his shoes as he stepped in. Anybody about, he said in French. The contrast between the brightest outside and the patchwork of shadows within made Freddy blink. But there was a pleasing smell of dust and afternoons glue and paper and polished wooden shelves. Particles of dust danced in and out of the beams of slatted sunlight. He was sure now that he had come to the right place and he felt somewhat unwind inside him. Relief that he had finally made it here, perhaps, or of it being his journey's end. Freddy took off his hat and gloves and placed them on the long wooden counter. Then he reached into the pocket of his suit jacket and brought out the small plastic board wallet. Hello! He called a second time. Bonsoir, Solarette. He heard footsteps and the creaks of the hinges of the small door at the back of the shop. A man walked through. Freddy's first impression was of flesh, rolls of skin at the neck and the wrists, a smooth, unlined face beneath the shock of white hair. He did not in any way look like the medieval scholar that Freddy was expecting. Bonjour, Solarette. The man nodded, cautious, 
bored, uninterested in any casual color. I need help with the translation, Freddy said, pushing the wallet across the counter. I was told you might be the man for such a job. Keeping his eye on Sorot, Freddy carefully slipped the letter out from its casing. It was a heavy weave, the color of a dirty chalk, not paper at all, but something far older. The handwriting was uneven and scratched. Sorot let his gaze slip to the letter, and Freddy watched him. His eyes sharpened with first surprise, then astonishment, then greed. May I? Be my guest. Taking a pair of half-moon spectacles from his top pocket, Sorot perched them on the end of his nose. He produced a pair of thin linen gloves from beneath the counter, pulled them on, holding the letter gently at the corner between forefinger and thumb. He held it up to the light. Parchment. Probably late medieval. Quite right. Written in Ositan, the old language of this region. Yes. All this Freddy knew. Sorot gave him a hard look, then dropped his eyes back to the letter. An intake of breath, then he began to read the opening lines out loud. His voice was surprisingly light. Bones and shadows and dust, I am the last. The others have slipped away into the darkness. Around me now, at the end of my days, only an echo in the still air of the memory of those who once I loved. Solitude, silence, plurie sound. Surat stopped and stared now with the interest of the reserved Englishman standing before him. He did not look like a collector, but then one never could tell. He cleared his throat. May I ask where you came by this, Munjol? Watson. Freddy took his card from his pocket and laid it with a snap on the counter between them. Frederick Watson. You are aware of this document of some historical significance? To me, its significance is purely personal. That may be, but nevertheless, Sorot shrugged. It is something that has been in your family for some time? Freddy hesitated. Is there somewhere we could talk? Of course. Sorot gestured to a low card table and four leather armchairs set in an alcove at the rear of the shop. Please. Freddy took the letter and sat down, watching as Sorot stooped beneath the counter again, this time producing two thick glass tumblers and a bottle of mellow golden brandy. He was unusually graceful, delicate even, Freddy thought, for such a large man. Surratt poured them both a generous measure, then lowered himself into a chair opposite. The leather sighed beneath his weight. So, can you translate it for me? Of course, but I am still intrigued to know how you came to be in possession of such a document. It's a long story. The same half shrug. I have the time. Freddy leaned forward and slowly fanned his long fingers across the surface of the table, making patterns on the green basé. Tell me, Sir Ott, do you believe in ghosts? A smile slipped across the old man's lips. I am listening. Freddy breathed in with relief of some other emotion. It was hard to tell. Well, then, he said, settling back in his chair. The story began some five years ago, not so very far from here.